Hey y'all and howdy. Welcome back to It's a Seago Thing. My name is Erin. This is a family-friendly, multi-purpose channel where I talk about anything and everything. So in this vlog, I'm going to talk about the difference with foster care and the church. If you guys have been following me, uh, which I'm very happy to say that we are still very strong on 123 subscribers, um, but if you guys have been following me, you have probably seen quite a few mentions and at least dedicated videos to foster care or adoption. So you're probably wondering why I frequently mention that the church uh, provides services, that, that there are churches that provide services, um, and that for you as a prospective foster or adoption parent or couple, um, for you guys to go check that out. Um, and I also try to encourage people who are not faith-based because that does actually happen and I do really want to touch on that um, because on one of my videos that I posted which I think would be in my personal development or my life playlist it may be in both I actually talk about what it is like to be in a different faith-based relationship uh, I am faith-based and my husband is not he is agnostic um, so for us, because that has never been an issue in our relationship, um, in fact, we've actually, we've actually had huge arguments on everything else. Um, for us, it never really was a debate on whether we should seek services through a church or through a Christian based organization or not. Um, one of the things that my husband recognizes is that although, um, you know, he does have his own personal struggles with organized religion and with how churches handle um, certain issues with, with parishioners, that doesn't deter him from not seeing the benefit and the positive aspects of church and organized religion. And he has never once um, given me a hard time about seeking services for foster and adoption parents through the church because one of the things that he recognized, both of us really recognized, was that although our relationship is, I guess in some people's uh, opinion, divided, you know, we recognize that the path to being a foster care parent, the path to being an adoption parent really requires all hands on deck. And you really do find out as you go through your own journey, as you begin to experience the, the nuances of this path that you're on, you really begin to see a lot of complicated issues. You really get to see the emotional toll that it takes on you as an individual and with your relationships in life. Whether you're in a relationship with a significant other or you're a single parent, this could this will impact, not could, but it, this will impact your relationships with family, friends, even your coworkers. So one of the reasons why for couples specifically, uh, or a single parent, if you are seeking to be a foster care parent, if you are seeking to be an adoption parent, but perhaps you're not faith-based, or perhaps your particular faith is not along the lines of what is considered mainstream mainstream Christianity. <clears throat> I'm still getting over my congestion, but I'm, I'm much better than I was, so I'm very happy about that. But let's say your faith is different, but you've been, you've been, um, I would say, you've been sent to a, a church that provides um, orphan care support services. And you'll hear a lot of that as you go through your, your um, process. You know, one of the things that I really try to encourage in, in most of my, especially my personal development videos, is I really want people to keep an open mind. I want their perspective to expand and to really receive a different way of looking at things and, and receiving things and processing things in our mind. If your particular church, if you are faith-based and your particular church does offer services, support services, Parents Night Out is one of those support services that you guys have probably heard me talk about, not specifically, but when you hear me say support services, that's the number one support service that all foster and adoption parents eventually, especially when they've been doing this long enough, 
that is something that all foster and adoption parents really cling on to because the parents' night out that is provided by the church, I mean, words can't even begin to describe the relief, the amazing ability that this provides you and your spouse, or if you are a single parent, just you to take a step back, to, to connect and reconnect, and to really evaluate where you're at. Working with children from hard places, specifically dealing with every child's trauma is traumatizing to you. And I think Child Protective Services, I, I really wanna say that they are, but I can't, unfortunately that's too general and that really kind of puts things as a finite. So I cannot for sure say that all Child Protective Services agencies are focusing, are aware of the secondary trauma that occurs with the foster parents and adoption parents when raising children um, or fostering them or adopting them um, or not uh, adopting them you're raising them for the most part but when you're fostering <laughs> you are raising the child but you're fostering them you're fostering your love for them and their nurture you know these parents these caregivers undergo secondary trauma and it is so important to have support services such as parents night out a support group or a class that provides you and your spouse or you ways of understanding how do I reach this child that I have taken the responsibility and the ownership in my heart to foster for them while their family uh, works the plan that is assigned to them by a lawyer called the ad litem and a judge how do I reach them? How do I connect to them? So classes like that really makes a difference. There are churches, um, I, Sean and I have not encountered this specifically, but there are churches that I've heard of where there are um, uh, spiritual leaders, uh, spiritual counselors on the church campus that provides counseling for people. Uh, who specifically are foster and adoption parents. And it doesn't mean that they, that they know exactly what you're going through, but they're able to help you assess your feelings, your thoughts, and how do these two really impact your entire self? And how is that projected onto someone else? And that's a very important thing for all of us to really consider is what are we projecting? What are we putting out there? when we're with these children and when we interact with the children's biological family. Um, one of the things that Sean and I really took to heart um, in some of the classes and support groups that we, sorry, the sun just kind of got a little reflective there, uh, that we really took to heart was to change our way of thinking, our perspective with the biological family connected to the children that come into our home. Uh, the last foster placement that we had, you know, we took a risk and we took a leap of faith in putting ourselves out there uh, so, that the, so that the biological family knew if they wanted to connect with us, if they wanted to um, have communication with us, that our doors and windows were open to them. And that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to have that opportunity every time. You know, we've had three cases in our home and then we've had two respite cases in our home. And with respite, you don't really get involved with the biological family. You're just more there to support, to, to provide support services for the foster family. But you are hearing about the experiences from that foster family. And so you're you're kind of taking that in and you're, you're really kind of bringing that to your own mind. Like, okay, well, if this were to occur, how would I react? But in other two, uh, in, in other foster experiences, the other two that we had, um, we had one where the biological family just refused to have uh, contact with us or communication. And then we had one that viewed us as the enemy just because we were the foster parents. And so that's hard, that's emotionally hard. So when you go to a church or you seek out a church that provides orphan care support services, um, or foster and adoption care services, you are surrounded by people 
who are walking the path that you're walking as a foster or adoption parent. And so you don't necessarily have to be a faith-based person and you don't even have to believe in the faith that the church that's providing those support services, you don't even have to believe in that particular faith. What was so healing for me and what was healing for my husband was just being around people who understood what we were going through, the fears, the concerns, the worries, the different anxieties and panics that we would have, also the heartache and the heartbreak and the loss and the grieving that comes with being a foster parent, sometimes even as an adoption parent. There were adoptive parents that we listened to um, that adopted internationally. There were adoptive parents who adopted um, I guess they're, they're considered domestic adoption, infant adoption. And sometimes these adoption cases, they are not able to be finalized. Um, sometimes with the international, I mean, everything from paperwork is not filed properly, so the adoption falls through, to um, during the trial time, when you're trying to bond with the child or, or children, depending on however many you bring home, oftentimes that is not able to be fulfilled for whatever reason. There are so many different reasons why the bonding experience doesn't always take because sometimes, you know, these children who are put up for adoption, you know, they may not be there. They may not be ready. And, and it's not necessary and it's not really their fault and it's not necessarily the fault of the agency. The agency is just doing what they can for the child because legally the child is ready for adoption and the child no longer has uh, rights to their biological family because the biological family was not able to uphold their rights. Um, in infant adoption, I, I cannot even, Sean and I can't even begin to tell you the stories that we've heard um, from parents who, because at least here in Texas, I, I, I don't know how this is in other states, but in Texas when you go through infant adoption, there is the what they call the 48 hour wait period. When we looked into infant adoption, um, that was a real, I won't lie, that was a real fear of mine especially because you, it is a significant investment, financial investment for domestic infant adoption. There is no guarantee because during that 48 hours, the, the mother, the biological mother that gives birth to the child in Texas, they are given the um, they are giving 48 hours to make a decision on whether they um, keep their baby or they continue with the adoption process. Now, this sounds weird for some people because the 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 biological mother in the domestic uh, in the domestic infant adoption program, the biological mother chooses. The couple who is desiring to adopt so you're chosen so you go through this very emotional experience of being chosen uh, sometimes you are in very um, intense communication with that biological parent who is pregnant with your future child and oftentimes there's a bond that that forms there you are providing a lot of services for the mother um, you're providing services for your soon-to-be child um, there are even there, oh my gosh, there were even stories of, of couples who were in the delivery room. Um, and then the mother decided after, or during the 48 hours, or, or right at 48 hours, that she decided to choose the baby, or to keep the baby, and not and not go through with adoption. And I'm not here to, to I really don't want to go down that path of, of debating, um, you know, that decision because that's a really complicated decision guys um, my heart feels for both parties because I cannot fathom I, I have never been in this situation nor nor will I ever be in this situation um, as you guys have gotten to know my story with infertility um, I am not able to naturally have children so I can never relate to a woman who is in a who is in a situation in life where becoming pregnant is is a bad thing or a scary thing. You know, I, I, I cannot relate to that. Nor could I ever relate to a woman who ever gets into a situation by becoming pregnant and has to go through the process of 
giving her child up for adoption. I can't even fathom that. My heart also breaks for the couple who is seeking adoption because I can relate to that. I can relate to the heartache and the heartbreak of either having failed fertility or unable to continue. In some, in some people's cases, they have secondary infertility. Um, in our case, it was just infertility. But there are couples who maybe were able to have their first child or maybe their second child, but they weren't able to have a third child or a fourth child, which is what they wanted for their family. And so they had to seek adoption or that was what they chose to complete their family. And so it's heartbreaking to hear from adoptive couples or an adoptive single parent um, have to go through that loss and that grief. But it's also a loss and a grief for the biological parent who is making the choice to give their child up for adoption. So it's, it's, it's a very complicated, uh, <laughs> very complicated topic. And so I'm not here to necessarily say one is right versus the other. Both parties hurt, both parties, you know, suffer, and both parties are grieving. This is one of the, uh, this is another reason why it is so important to seek out services, which right now churches seem to be the ones that do that. I, I would love to see more communities providing um, what I would call community-based services for people of all walks of life. There are many churches, unfortunately, still to this day, I don't know why, but they just do. There are many churches to this day that still refuse to provide services for certain people of walk of life. And I'm not here to name names, and I cannot say all churches do. I've just, I have heard from other people uh, when I've attended support groups, and when Sean and I have attended support groups, we have, oh my gosh, we have attended support groups at agencies and at churches, and we have heard really upsetting stories of people who were treated in in, in inappropriate or, or or ill ways at churches because either they were a gay couple, or they were a single parent, um, or maybe they just didn't fit a certain a certain stereotype that's that people I, I don't know somehow relate to or whatnot. I'm not really sure why that happens. I do know there are great churches out there that do provide wonderful support services. Um, I will say I feel fortunate to live in Houston because I have come to learn about many churches around Houston that really does go above and beyond for their foster and adoption parents. Um, I think there's a lot of improvement still to be had, but I think that's with any situation in life. But the, the changes that have occurred just in the last three years, when Sean and, I've, Sean and I's main experience for foster and adoption has been, I think the improvements that I've seen personally and even Sean has commented with me, um, I'm, I'm happy to see these changes. And I'm hoping that more changes will continue uh, to, to come forth because there are a lot of people out there 